Praise the Lord. Wow, what an incredible time to worship our living Savior. I want you to take your Bibles. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to two passages of Scripture. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And then if you will also turn and mark in your Bible, 1 Peter, chapter 1. Luke, chapter 24, and 1 Peter, chapter 1. Today, the message I'm bringing is called, Because of the Resurrection. It began with sort of an uncomfortableness in his throat. He really wasn't sure what was happening. Just had a constant tickling in his throat that wouldn't go away. And it was hard for him as a preacher because it was bothering him most of the time, especially when he would try to preach. And then he began to notice that every now and then his leg would drag a little bit and he just couldn't walk exactly right. His name was William Sankster. He was a British pastor in London, a Methodist pastor there, and he was instrumental in guiding that city of London through the bombings of World War II, a very influential, godly man. He began to notice all of these physical symptoms that were happening, and when they didn't go away, he went to his doctor. The doctor examined him, and after the examination was over, he said, Mr. Sangster, you have a degenerative muscular disease. And he said, over a period of time, your muscles are just going to deteriorate. He said, eventually, you won't be able to walk. Then you'll lose your ability to move altogether. Maybe your hand will will still be able to have control over your hand. He said, but probably you won't be able to move. He said, "You'll, you'll lose the ability to speak. Eventually, you'll lose the ability to breathe. And he said, and... I'm very sorry to tell you this, but Mr. Sangster, we have no way of treating your disease. And so Pastor William Sangster went home that day with a death sentence facing him. And he decided with everything that he was, that he would take his life that he had and keep serving the Lord. He preached for as long as he could preach. When he could no longer preach, he wrote letters and he organized prayer groups all over England. He would travel to encourage them even as he could not speak. Eventually, he got to where he could not move. He was confined to his home. He could not speak at all. He could still, with a trembling hand, write a few words. And on his last Easter Sunday... He took a pen in hand, and with a trembling hand, he wrote a letter to his daughter, and it said this, how terrible to wake up on Easter and to have no voice to shout, he is risen. And then he wrote, far worse, though, to have a voice and not want to shout. Jesus Christ is risen. And so I say he is risen, and you say he is risen indeed. Say it with all of, all of the power you can say it. He is risen. Say it. He is risen indeed. He is. The greatest truth in all of the universe is that Jesus Christ, God's son, left heaven, came to earth, lived a perfect, sinless life was betrayed into the hands of sinful men, died on the cross of Calvary, offered up his life, shouted out to God the Father, it is finished, yielded up his spirit, was taken down from that cross, dead and then buried in a grave. They sealed the tomb with a stone. And for three days, he was there. And on the third day, early on that resurrection Sunday morning, he came out of that grave, he is alive and he lives forevermore. And that changes everything about your life and my life today. At the beginning of our service, you heard the different people of different ages sharing the story of Scripture, the story of the resurrection from Luke chapter 24. And you heard about the women making their way to the tomb, how they were wondering Who would roll the heavy stone away from them from the sealed entrance of the Lord's tomb? And how when they got there, they found that the stone had been rolled away and two angels were awaiting them and asked this question, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. 
just as he said. The Bible says that those women made their way back to the city of Jerusalem and found the place where the disciples were. And when they got there and shared the story of what they had seen and what they had heard, that the disciples heard them and were skeptical. It seemed like some type of a crazy story that these women had made up. But one disciple, the Bible says, Peter, who sometimes was was reckless but always was bold. Peter ran from Jerusalem out to the tomb to see. And we read what happened in Luke chapter 24, verse 12. Will you stand with me as we read God's word together? Luke chapter 24, verse 12. The Bible says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter saw that the tomb was empty. He saw those cloths that they had used to wrap the Lord Jesus' body there lying in their place and went home marveling, amazed at what had happened. And then, probably 30 years later, we read the words that Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, reflecting back on that day when he came to the empty tomb. Peter writes, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we love you and praise you. We thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the glory of your resurrection And thank you, Lord, that it's not just a story and it's not just something that happened long ago, far away. Lord, it's something that makes a difference in our lives today and for all eternity. Lord God, I ask that you would speak to our hearts today and show us what the resurrection means to us from your word. For we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to keep your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 3 through 9 of this text. And as we do, I want to talk to you about four truths about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Four truths about how the resurrection changes your life and my life today. First of all, the Word of God shows us that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can have hope that lives forever. You can have hope that lives forever. Look again at verse 3 and verse 4 of this chapter. And there the Bible says that according to his great mercy, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I would ask you this question this morning. Are you a born-again Christian? And before you answer, can I tell you this? A born-again Christian is the only type of, of Christian there is. So are you a born-again Christian? If you've been saved, the Bible says you've been born again. And to be born again is to cross a line. It's to cross a line from death into life. It's to cross a line from being unforgiven into being forgiven. It's to cross a line from being hopeless into having a living Hope. And, and the Bible says that through the resurrection, Jesus has given us a living hope. And then look in verse 4 of the text. The Bible describes our hope in Jesus as an inheritance, something that a child receives. You've been born again. You are part of God's family. And here is your hope. Here is your inheritance. The Bible says you have been born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. The Bible describes our hope, this inheritance, with four different words or phrases. It's imperishable. That means it can never spoil. It is undefiled. That means it can never be tarnished or dulled. It is 
unfading. That's a word that they used in mythology to talk about a certain mythological flower that never died, that never faded. Its bloom blooms forever and ever. That's what the Word of God says about our hope. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading. And it is kept in heaven for you. The very power of God himself guards over your hope. If you know Jesus Christ, if you've been saved because of his resurrection, you have a hope that lives forever. Some people are in this room and, and you've lost your hope. Maybe your circumstances have become such that it's just hard for you to feel like you have any hope at all. You feel like you're in a deep, dark hole somewhere and you just can't get out. And there are all kinds of things that we do when we become hopeless. Sometimes we cut off our relationships with people who we used to care about and who still care about us, but we just can't face them because we've lost hope. Some people sleep all the time or eat too much or try to bury their hopelessness and mask it with activity or with drugs or with alcohol or something else. The good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ today is you can have a hope that never goes away. Jesus rose from the grave so that you can have hope. There was a school system that had a program in a certain city, and, and the program was for students who had long-term illnesses or who were in the hospital, and the school would send out tutors into the hospitals to meet with these school students to help them keep up with their assignments so that they didn't fall behind. And one lady was going out to tutor this boy who was in the hospital. He had been in an accident. He was badly burned. And uh, she met with the boy's teacher before she went to the hospital. The teacher said, well, I just need you to go if you can just help him and go over nouns and adverbs. That's the main thing he needs to go over. And so she came to his hospital room and she walked in and this tutor saw this boy badly burned in his hospital bed. And she had a hard time even being in the room and really a hard time finding her words. But, but she opened up her lesson plan and she said, today I'm here to work with you on nouns and adverbs. And she went through the lesson and he barely responded. She went home and really felt like she had just failed that day. But she came back the next day. When she came back the next day, one of the nurses met her before she got to the boy's room and said, what did you say to that boy yesterday? And she said, I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 was, I, just, I don't know what I said. She said, I'm, I'm so sorry if I messed anything up. And the nurse said, no, you don't understand. This boy, we wondered if he would live. And we wondered if he wanted to live. But something happened when you left yesterday, and it's been true all day today. All of a sudden, he, he's responding. All of a sudden, he's just, he's talking to us. All of a sudden, he wants to get better. And she went in and taught the lesson again. And, and in the weeks and, and the months that, that went by, the boy got better and better and better. And soon he was fully recovered. And someone asked him, why, why did that day with that tutor make such a difference? He said, well, I figured they wouldn't send someone to go over nouns and adverbs with a dying boy. She brought him hope. Jesus Christ wouldn't have come. He wouldn't have died. He wouldn't have risen from that grave if there was no hope. God speaks to you today right where you are. And he says, because Jesus is alive, you can have hope that lives forever. But then continuing on in the text, the Bible shows us because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can have a salvation that lasts forever. A salvation that lasts forever. Look in verse 5 of the text. And there the Bible describes those who have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Bible says this about you if you've been saved. It says, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The Bible says that you are being guarded. If you've been saved, God is guarding over you. He's like a soldier watching you keeping you, protecting you. He's guarding over you for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. When your life is over, 
when time is over. If you've been saved, you have an inheritance that is salvation that lasts forever. And listen, you can't do anything to lose your salvation if you've been saved because you never did anything to get your salvation. Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross for your salvation. He gives it to you as his free gift. And the Bible says he guards over you to give that salvation to you because you are his child. There was a man who came to faith in Christ and he had been baptized and, and he, was, he was trying to grow in his relationship with Jesus but he was just really struggling with a lot of doubts. And so he went to meet with his pastor. He went to the pastor's home. And, and he just said, Pastor, you know, it seems like every time I sin, I think I've lost my salvation. And she, I, he said, I know I've been baptized. I know, I know that I prayed to receive Christ. I know I've been baptized. I've done those things. He said, but every time I sin, I feel like I've lost my salvation. The pastor was standing there. He pointed to his dog. He said, you see that dog? Man said, yeah. He said, that's my dog. He said, he's a good dog. He obeys. When I call him, he comes. When I tell him to sit, he sits. He's housebroken. He never makes a mess. He's a good dog. Now look behind me. You see in my kitchen, that's my little baby boy. He is a mess. <laughs> he throws food all over the place. He soils his clothes. He cries all the time. He doesn't do what we ask him to do or what we want him to do a lot of the time. He said, but listen, if I die tonight, this good dog gets nothing. And that baby boy who's a mess gets everything because he's my son. When you come to Jesus Christ, you come into God's family and you belong to his family forever. In fact, God promises that he guards over you. Look again in verse five. By God's power, you are being guarded through faith. As you trust in Jesus, you are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Because Jesus Christ is alive, you can have hope that lives forever. You can have a salvation that lasts forever. But then there's a third truth about the resurrection of Jesus in this text. The Bible says because of the resurrection of Jesus, you can have joy that lingers forever. You can have a joy. If you've been saved because of the resurrection of Jesus, you can have a joy that never goes away even when your circumstances are terrible. Peter talks about it as we continue in verses 6 and 7 of the text. And Peter says, in this you rejoice. And it's important to know what Peter was referring to when he said this. This in verse 6 refers to every part of your salvation. Everything that God has done to save you. The death of Jesus on the cross. His resurrection from the grave. The inheritance that he's promised you. The way he keeps you and saves you. The Bible says in this you rejoice. Though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that because of Jesus, you have a joy that lingers even when, look again in verse six, even when for a little while, if necessary, you are grieved by various trials. It doesn't take long living on this earth to realize that things happen that grieve us. We experience trials that hurt us and we wonder how long and how hard is this going to be and how am I going to be able to make it through? But the Bible says that through Jesus, even when we are grieved, we can have joy. I, I would imagine that as Peter wrote these words, he thought back on those days after Jesus died on the cross, those three heartbreaking days for Peter and all of the disciples. They had left what they had been doing, Peter, a fisherman, others doing other things. And for three years, they had followed him and put all of their hopes on him and trusted in him and found their joy 
in him. They had followed him and they had believed him when he had said he was the son of God and the Messiah who had come to deliver God's people from their sins and to bring eternal life to everyone who trusts in him. And then he was arrested and betrayed and crucified. They buried him in that tomb and they walked away. Peter was grieved. His joy was gone. But Jesus Christ, who rose from the grave, rose not only to restore their joy, but to amplify the joy of his followers in a joy that they had never experienced before. Listen, if you have been saved, God wants to give you a joy that is deeper than anything else you can experience. When you meet Jesus Christ, he transforms every part of your life. And Satan knows that. And that's why he fights so hard against the truth and the joy of the resurrection. Over the centuries, Satan has inspired all kinds of theories that people have offered up to try to explain away the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you just about a a number of the theories. I want to talk to you about sort of the four top theories that people have given to try to explain away the resurrection and cast doubt on the resurrection of Jesus. One popular theory has been what is often called the swoon theory. The swoon theory says that when Jesus was on the cross because of the blood loss and the stress, that he went into some type of deep coma. They thought he was dead, but but he really was just swooning. He just was in a coma. And they took him down off of the cross and they put him in the grave. And then while he was there in the grave, the coolness of the grave somehow brought him back to, 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 to life, sort of brought him back to consciousness because he'd never been dead. And, and then he, he was able to somehow, even though he had lost all this blood, he, he unwrapped all of the grave clothes and he rolled away the heavy stone. And then he walked back into the city of Jerusalem and found his way to the upper room where the disciples were and appeared to them and they all thought he was risen. A popular religion columnist who wrote under the pen name Eutychus received this letter about the resurrection. It said this, Dear Eutychus, our preacher said on Easter that Jesus just swooned on the cross and his disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Signed, Bewildered. Eutychus responded, Dear Bewildered, beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails 39 times. Nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, and put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. Sincerely, Eutychus. Well, that's the swoon theory. No, the Bible shows us clearly they verified Jesus was dead. They buried him. He was dead. They walked away and sealed the tomb. He was dead. But one popular theory is called the swoon theory. Another theory is what is sometimes called the wrong tomb theory. It says this, even though the women who came to the tomb on Easter, even though they had just been to the tomb on Friday and they saw where Jesus had been and they had taken care of him even while he was then there, that, that they went back and when they came back to the tomb on Easter Sunday, somehow they went to the wrong tomb. And that tomb was empty. And so they just assumed Jesus had risen, went back to the disciples, brought everybody back to the wrong tomb, and they thought he was risen because they went to the wrong tomb. First of all, this says that the women who came to the tomb had zero short-term memory. That's the first thing you have to think. And then also that all of the disciples were absolutely gullible. Friend, they didn't go to the wrong tomb. They went to the right tomb, and Jesus was not there. There's a third theory that says the disciples stole the body. I call it the disciples stole the body theory. Now, now this theory is actually found in in, in the Bible. This this whole idea that the disciples stole the body of Jesus is found in the Bible. Look in your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 28, verses 12 and 13 of the text. This theory is 2,000 years old, and yet it's sort of the official line for some people even today. Well, no, they just... They just stole the body and they pretended that he had risen when he had not. Here's where the, where the Bible says that theory began. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 12. It's talking about the religious leaders of the Jewish people. It says, and when they had assembled with the elders 
and had taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers, the soldiers who had been guarding the tomb, and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And so that became the story. Did he rise from the grave? Oh, no. His disciples came and stole his body away while we were asleep. That became the official story. There are some people who think that today. But here's the problem. All the disciples other than one died for preaching that Jesus had risen. Only one disciple, John, died a natural death. And he died in prison on the island of Patmos for having preached the resurrection of Jesus. All the rest of them were killed. Some of them were crucified. Some of them were beheaded. Some of them were stabbed with knives. Some of them were run through with spears. Some of them were shot with arrows. Some of them were thrown down from high places and stoned. One of them was skinned alive. All of them insisted to their dying breath, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he proved that he is the Son of God by dying on the cross and rising from the dead on the third day. Who would die for a lie? Now, now someone might die for a lie that someone else told them, but who would die for a lie that they themselves made up? One of them would have broke. One of them would have spilled the beans. One of them would have said, no, we just, we stole the body and made this up and wanted to start a new religion. No, they died preaching the resurrection because Jesus truly rose from the grave. So we can just sort of put away that theory that the disciples stole the body. A final theory offered is what is called the mass hallucination theory. It just says this, that the disciples after Jesus had died were there in the upper room and, and they started talking about how much they love Jesus and how much they miss Jesus. And, and one of them said, you know, it's, it's just like he's, he's here with us. I can almost feel that he's here. And somebody said, well, I can, I can see him. And it was just a mass hallucination that Jesus never truly rose. The word of God addresses that theory and that lie very clearly as well. Take your Bibles and look with me to Acts chapter one, verse three. And there the Bible says this, Jesus presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. The Bible says that Jesus appeared not just once, but he offered many proofs. That word proof means something you do to convince somebody who otherwise would not believe. They, they didn't believe at first that he had risen. They were skeptical. So for a period of 40 days, and, and the word of God shows us even beyond that, Jesus kept showing his disciples he was alive. You go through the pages of your Bible and you'll discover that the Bible lists at least 17 times that Jesus appeared to people after his death, burial, and resurrection. 17 times. Times. I'm going to go through 17 times and just give them to you. I'll tell you the, about the event, and then I'll tell you the, the book and the chapter. And you can look it up in your Bible. He appeared to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, John 20. He appeared to the other women who returned to his tomb in Matthew 28. He appeared to Peter, Luke chapter 24. He appeared to two disciples as they walked on the road to Emmaus, Luke chapter 24. He appeared to the 10 disciples with Thomas missing, John chapter 20. Then a week later, he appeared to the 10 disciples on the night that, that he rose. Then a week later, he appeared to the 11 disciples, including Thomas. You can read about that in John chapter 20. You remember what Thomas said? Thomas was not up for any type of a hallucination. Thomas said, unless I see him, and specific, I don't care what you say. I know y'all said you saw him last week. Unless I see him and the nails in his hands and his feet and can put my fingers in the place where the nails were and my hand in his side, unless I see him, I will not believe. And Jesus showed up. Praise God for that. And Thomas saw him and said, my Lord and my 
God. He appeared to the, the, the 11 disciples, including Thomas. And then next, he appeared to seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee in John chapter 21. He appeared to 500 believers at once, 1 Corinthians 15. He appeared to James, the Lord's half-brother, again, 1 Corinthians 15. He appeared to the 11 disciples on a mountain in Galilee, Matthew chapter 28. He appeared to a group of believers as he ascended up into the clouds of heaven, Luke chapter 28. He appeared to Stephen, the deacon, as Stephen was martyred, Acts chapter 7. And then he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, to Paul in Arabia, Galatians chapter 1, to Paul in the temple in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 9, to Paul in prison in Caesarea, Acts chapter 23, and to John on the island of Patmos in Revelation chapter chapter 1. The Bible says after he suffered, he presented himself alive to his disciples. This was no hallucination. This wasn't something that happened in some dark corner somewhere. This wasn't somebody trying to talk themselves into something. This was Jesus Christ who had died, who had been buried risen, alive, and showing that he was risen and alive. And because of that, Though the disciples had lost their joy and were despondent, he gave them new joy. He restored their joy. He amplified their joy because Jesus Christ is alive. I praise God for the joy that Jesus gives us because he is alive. Let's just give him praise in this place today. <laughs> Do you have joy? Do you have joy? Do you have joy? If you have Jesus, then even when the circumstances of life may grieve you, somewhere underneath the surface, somewhere deep within, there will still be joy. And if today you would say, I, I really don't have joy, you need to ask yourself, do you have Jesus? Because Jesus can meet you at your deepest point of grief and hurt and pain and give you joy. You can have joy that lingers forever. One other thing, one other truth about the resurrection of Jesus. Number four, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have a Savior who loves you forever. Look in verses eight and nine of our text. The Bible says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Peter had seen him, but the people to whom he was writing, just as we are, they, they, they had never seen Jesus. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Because Jesus rose from the grave, you have a Savior who loves you forever. The Bible says you love him. And friend, the reason we love him is because he loves us so much. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says this. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Why do we love him? It's not because we're so loving. It's not because we have a great capacity to love. We love him in response to his love for us. We love him because he loved us. And here's how he showed he loved us. He sent his son, Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation simply means this. It means the sacrifice that pays the price. Jesus died on the cross as the sacrifice to pay the price for my sins and your sins. If you ever wonder how much God loves you, just look to the cross. He loves you so much that Jesus died to be the sacrifice that pays the price for your sins. I want you to imagine going into a church, and it's an unusual church. Everyone is there, and they're trying to deal with their sins. And there's a group of efficiency experts that are at the front of the church, and, and they're trying to, to make sure that everybody deals with their sins. And th So there's a long line and then a table at the front and you take your place in line, there are four or five people in front of you, and you're just watching as people are coming up to this table. And everybody that comes to the table at this church is being asked two questions. What's your name and what's your sin? 
And so you see John, he comes up to the table. They say, what's your name? He says, John. They say, John, what's your sin? He said, well, one time I, um, I took some money that didn't belong to me from my employer. So they take a big sticker and write, John, thief. And they stick it on him and it won't come off. Then the next person comes up. What's your name? Mary. Well, Mary, what's your sin? She said, well, sometimes I stretch the truth a little bit. Mary, liar, put on the sign. It sticks on her, won't come off. And then the next person, what's your name? George. George, what's your sin? He said, I was unfaithful to my wife. George, adulterer, put on the sign. A little girl's right in front of you. She steps up. What's your name? Abigail, what's your sin? She said, sometimes I don't obey my parents. Abigail, disobedient, puts on the sign. And everybody, you included, everybody's wearing a sign with their name and their sin in big, bold letters, and you can't take it off. Would you like to go to a church like that? And as you're standing there, everybody's got their sin for everybody to see. And into the church comes Jesus. And somehow Jesus does what nobody else can do. He can take that sign off of every person. And so he takes John's sign, puts it on himself. And Mary's sign puts it on himself. George's sign puts it on. Little Abigail's sign. He takes your sign, your name, your sin, puts it on himself. And then with all of everyone's sin on him, he goes to the cross. And there as he suffers and bleeds and dies, he pays the price. He makes propitiation, the sacrifice that pays the price for all of those sins. Then after he dies on the cross, they take him and put him in the grave and they seal the tomb with a stone. And he's there on the first day and the second day. And on the third day, the stone rolls away. Jesus is alive. And he comes out and walks back into that church. And, and all of those signs with all of those sins, the sins have been taken away. The names are there, but the sins are no longer there. And he comes to everyone with a new sign that says this, John, beloved and forgiven child of God. Mary, beloved and forgiven child of God. George, beloved and forgiven child of God. Abigail, beloved and forgiven child of God. And then he comes to you and he puts that sign on you. It's your name in gold letters. Beloved and forgiven child of God. Because Jesus Christ rose from that grave, you have a Savior who loves you forever. And right now he promises that everyone who trusts in him, he brings into God's family forever. Beloved and forgiven child of God. We 